uh, living in Indonesia from 1998 to 2000 and in India from 2004 to 2007. He taught at the Harvard Kennedy School from 2000 to 2019, where he was at times the faculty chair of the MPA ID degree program. Having twice retired, he is currently affiliated with the Oxford Blavatnik School of Government as the research director of the RISE program, is the research, is the research director at LAMP, the Labor Mobility Partnerships, and is a fellow at the London School of Economics. He's published over 100 journal articles, working papers, chapters, and books, working with over 50 different co-authors. His publications span a wide range of development topics, economic growth, state cap capability, education, labor mobility, development, development assistance, and more. So we're quite fortunate to have uh, Dr. Pritchard with us today. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Pritchard. So maybe in the q and I will learn what social policy and intervention means. Because uh, it's clear from my resume, that's not what I do. I'm a development economist. And as a development economist, I cover lots of topics that have to do with the development process. And one of those is education. Um, and so I have been uh, the research director of a project that is in its eighth year uh, and has been a very large, multi-country, multi-method, multi-discipline research project. And I have, I can either, I, in doing the presentation, I wanted to give some like factual background about education in the developing world. And I decided that take too much time because we now know, having done eight years of research, way too much about it to summarize very quickly. So instead, this is mainly methodological. And so the, the, the title of learning about learning from learning about learning is a methodological thing. What is a reasonable methodology one can approach to learning about why some countries are actually quite effective at the educational process and why some countries are radically ineffective? Um, but even more than that, um, it is going to be about um, one particular way of learning about learning that has um, been very, very popular in development economics. Uh, three uh, development economists won a Nobel Prize for um, their promotion of this. And so, and it's a particularly kind of approach both to the generation and use of evidence that seems really cool. Uh, I'm going to argue that it's gibberish. It's just completely without scientific or evidentiary foundation for the purposes to which it is claimed to be effective in deployment. Uh, and so, oh, and I, I was wondering whether the word gibberish was too strong. Um, and then I realized I made it more intense. It's gibberish of the worst sort. Um, uh, so, and it is uh, gibberish of the worst sort and that it's not obviously gibberish. It sounds really attractive and plausible to say, you should base your decisions by relying on the rigorous evidence. It sounds like a truism or a theorem. Of course, you should rely on the rigorous evidence, but I'm going to show four different objections to that as an actual pragmatic way of going about learning about learning, okay? Um, and there's sort of four things. <laughs> First is there's a huge, overwhelming, incapacitating problem with external validity. The nature of development is that there's lots of countries in the world, and those countries differ in lots of ways. And so there is no evidence that's rigorous across contexts. And that's such that the standard methodology proposing for using evidence actually leads you to worse rather than better choices in a way that I'll be quite precise about. The second is the claims of, and I'm abbreviating it, making an acronym of rely on the rigorous evidence or ROAR. It doesn't even meet the barest um, test of a scientific claim in that you can't even make it logically consistent. Um, <laughs> you can't express it in such a way that it doesn't generate internal contradictions. 
that's a very bad thing for a scientific claim that it can't even be logically consistent. And I'll show you what I, again, what I mean by that. I mean, all of this is going to rely on a specifically empirical example in which I illustrate these conceptual points in an empirical example. The third is that in addition to external validity, which is the how well the evidence about specific actions or interventions and their impact translate across context. There's also a massive and more or less insuperable problem of what I call construct validity, that most of the ways in which evidence is summarized is they're summarizing evidence about classes of interventions. And the class conveys relatively little information about the instance of the class. So I'm making statements about cars. It's like, well, okay, you can make some statements about cars, but any car you drive is an instance of a car. And each instance of a car could be radically different um, from another instance of a car. And so the within class heterogeneity means some statements about cars are gonna be <laughs> valid, but it's gonna be very difficult to say something rigorous and precise about cars. You can say something rigorous and precise about this car, but to be rigorous and precise is inconsistent with talking about a class that has enormous within class heterogeneity. And that's the idea of construct validity. Um, and then finally, implementation fidelity is low. Um, <laughs> and so even if you could make in principle uh, evidence-based recommendation about an intervention that has been demonstrated to work if it's implemented with fidelity is irrelevant if your key problem is your lack of ability to implement with fidelity. So it's sort of like, <laughs> I may be able to tell you um, exactly how to hit uh, a winning forehand, but if your problem is, is that you just really are incapable of the range of motions that it takes, that evidence is not really of any use to you. Um, it's it, You could give me evidence about with the actual athletic capabilities I have, how should I hit a forehand, which might be radically different from here's the optimal way to hit a forehand. Just this, uh, okay, so those are, that's the outline. So first, um, there's a slogan that policymaking should be evidence-based. Uh, and again, I think being evidence-based is vacuous because um, until you specify what counts as evidence, saying something should be evidence-based is like just constructive ambiguity, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and there is a subset of that that says you should rely on the rigorous evidence that, you know, and it's introduced now this very freighted modifier of evidence, rigorous evidence, you rely on the rigorous evidence. And the practical instantiation of the slogan is something like studies are done and the main focus of the studies is causal identification. We want to really be able to demonstrate that this particular intervention had this particular effect. So we are getting cause and effect, right? And hence rigorous is <laughs> conflated with achieves credible causal identification versus observational, in which I just say, look, X is, tends to be associated with Y, and I haven't you know, precisely drilled down on that I can, it's plausibly causable. Then after having done some amount of studies that achieve plausible and credible, or at least credible causal identification, then what we do is we do a systematic review of the literature. We look at the literature, we impose a filter in which we throw away all of the information that isn't from the well-identified studies. And then we summarize that as the gold standard. And then the last step is, you know, policy and program design are meant to be based on this systematic review of the rigorous studies. So we've, that is the content. This has actually become you know, quite popular in development. This is held up as the ideal standard. Um, there are entire organizations uh, that have come into existence to, you know, create the rigorous evidence to inform policy. So this is a vision of how to learn about learning as well as a, a variety of other things. And it really seems to make so much sense. Like if you're going to undertake policies that have 
produce certain effects, having rigorous evidence that causally identifies the effect of those policies and interventions might seem super important. Um, and therefore, this um, approach of relying on the rigorous evidence um, has a ton of rhetorical appeal. Like it seems like, yeah, well, uh, how could you be against it? Okay, I'm going to tell you how you can be against it. <laughs> or how I'm against it, and maybe, okay. So the main problem is, is everything in practice is about magnitudes, not about black and white, this or that. So let's just start with a really simple example um, of a way in which relying on the rigorous evidence would actually produce the wrong set of decisions. And that's, my job is to fit men's pants and to give each man the right size pant, right? In particular length. But I know that men tend to lie about their height. <laughs> men tend to say they're taller than they really are. And so a man's self-report is not rigorous evidence about his actual height. <laughs> it's biased evidence. It tend, they tend to say they're taller than they are. So the, there's a gap between the self-reported height and their actual height. So I could say, I should do a study in which I actually measure a whole random sample of men. So I know precisely the distribution of height across all men. And then I have rigorous evidence on men's height. But I have rigorous evidence, and that rigorous evidence is going to produce a distribution. It's going to produce a distribution with a mean and some variability. Now, when I confront any given man, if I use the rigorously estimated average height as my estimate of that man's height, I'm going to make an error because I'm using the distribution and not that man. So it's perfectly plausible <laughs> that the, the errors, and I call, I, I'm going to use a measure called the root mean squared error. As I take each man, I take the, the gap between the size of the pant I give them based on the rigorous evidence and his actual desired size, I square that so that deviations add up. And then I take the square root of that. So it's the root mean squared error as a standard measure of prediction accuracy. It's perfectly possible to rely on the rigorous evidence produces much worse outcomes in terms of average prediction error than just relying on men's lie. Because <laughs> if in fact, the bias is about an inch, that I say I'm 5'10 when I'm really 5'9, because it's hard to say I'm much taller than that. If I say I'm 6'4, you just know I'm a liar. You don't think, oh, he's 6'4, that's so impressive, right? <laughs> uh, so um, if you know, if if the bias is actually small relative to the underlying heterogeneity, then relying on the mean of the rigorous evidence could be much worse than relying on the lies the lies are scaled to the truth much more accurately than is the rigorous evidence. So the true height variability across men in the United States is a standard deviation about three inches. And so if you do this calculation, the root mean square error of using for each man, the average of the rigorous evidence is much worse than just taking their lie at face value. And what's even better, by the way, is to just reduce an inch from every man's height. And then you're starting from the bias and correcting for the bias rather than attempting to correct for the actual accurate measurement of height. Okay. So all of this is, I've invented this analogy because all of this is exactly true in real data from education around the world. So um, what I'm gonna give is, um, I'm gonna be talking about um, the public sector what I call the private sector learning premium. And we're just gonna start with the private sector learning premium as a raw number. I just take a sample of all children that are in school. I test them all on some mastery of some particular domain like mathematics or science or reading. And then I can just calculate the difference between the scores of kids who are enrolled in private school and the scores of kids who are enrolled in public school. And that's just a fact about the world. It's not, it has no causal interpretation. It's just a fact about the world. 
that directly has no policy implication because we don't know precisely if moving a child from public school to private school would improve that child's learning versus it just happens that kids who were going to score high anyway because they were from privileged backgrounds are in private school. So we have to decompose before we can make any causal use. We have to decompose the raw private sector premium into a causal component and a selectivity component. Okay. So the first way we do that is we do it with observables. We say we know kids who are rich from richer households are both more likely to go to a public school, private school, and, and and I'm using it in the American, not the British sense. But I'll forgive me for that. Um, uh, um, so uh, the we just then what we do is we use some empirical association and we say. Here's the predicted score of an observationally equivalent child that has the same household wealth, if parents have the same education, same sex, same whatever observables about the child. We have a bunch of X's. We correct for the X's and we say, here's the learning difference between two children with equivalent X's, right? And now this is what I call the public sector learning premium X, right? And so the private sector learning premium X, oh my gosh, it's... <laughs> I need to be a little more careful. So the private sector learning treatment X, it's still a biased, but what I wanted was what we in economics call the local average treatment effect. I'm not sure that that language is common, but the local average treatment effect is the causal impact of taking a given child and placing them and moving them across school and see after having been exposed to this school versus that school, how much more learning they have. So that's the late. The late is not the adjusted, it's not the raw private sector learning premium, it's not the adjusted, because there could be factors that we haven't observed in the set of X's that also both make it more likely for you to be in private school and make it more likely to have high scores. So we have to get to the late. Um, and so what the rely on the rigorous evidence school is saying is until we get to the late, we don't have any useful data on which we can like make policy or guess what would be the impact of moving a student. Um, and so what I'm going to show is I have a data set in which I have a large number of estimates of the raw private sector learning premium. I have a large number of estimates of the adjusted private sector learning premium. And then I have a large number of estimates of what we'll take of, we'll take for these purposes today as the late. And the way we got to the late was by doing an adjustment in which what we do is we take the selectivity that was observed in moving from the raw to the X and make extrapolations of, based on the underlying empirics of this adjustment how much more adjustment for selectivity would happen when we adjusted for the unobservables. And I'm not gonna sort of get in super deep into this, but just intuitively you think, suppose I know there are two factors and they have equal impact on scores and they have equal selectivity. Then if I do the adjustment for one of them that I happen to have observations for, I just double it. Right? I just assume that the truth when I've adjusted for the selectivity of the variable I didn't observe is going to be at least as big as adjusting for the variability of the one I did. Right? And it's sort of, and we do this in such a way that it actually creates, it's intended to create a lower bound in the sense that let's make extreme assumptions about the selectivity of the unobservables such that we're confident that the true late is bigger than that. Right? So it's a, these are called, uh, Emily Oster is the um, economist who's made these popular and famous and wide use, and we call them Oster lower bounds. So we're, it, because it overestimates, it, it sort of, it says, let's pick a, assumptions about the magnitude of the unobservables and their selectivity such that we're reasonably confident we've got the late or worse, right? So we're being conserved. Okay. So. This is what, um, so I'm going to show you some sort of <laughs> hopefully intuition building graphs. Um, 
And these intuition building graphs consist of a bunch of box plots. And you've all seen box plots before, hopefully. A box plot. This what's colored. Oh, man, I didn't even touch it. Sensitive. It's a very sensitive screen. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so what's in the yellow is the range between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. Um, the line in the middle is the median. Um, and then the upper ends are sort of the, the range of the data. And then I have, I'm going to start with three sources um, of the raw private sector premium. This is just and this is all going to be measured in standard deviation units. So you do an assessment, you take a student standard deviation of that assessment, right? And then this is how many more, this is, <laughs> if it's positive number, this is how many standard deviations or fractions of a standard deviation the student in private school than the student in a public school was when assessed. And so I have one source that has like 60 observations and a completely different methodological source that has 30 observations. And reassuringly, these two completely independent estimates come up with exactly the same number. <laughs> so both of them say uh, the raw private sector learning premium is about 0.6. So, um, and this is testing kids that are roughly 15, they're roughly 15 years old, so late secondary. So that's the cumulative effect. It's not the one year effect, it's the cumulative effect of the entire path. Um, uh, okay, so, but we also see there's a massive variability across countries, right? This isn't a number that's concentrated. Um, in Brazil, uh, the student in the private school is going to score about a standard deviation higher. And just to give you some intuition, in a typical setting, a year of schooling produces about a third to a, about 0.3 to 0.4 of a standard deviation. So a student in a private school would, in another metric, be about three grade levels ahead of a student in a public school. So that's huge, right? A one standard deviation difference in education terms is just like jaw dropping to people, to those of us that work with these data all the time. Like, <laughs> you never get a program that produces a one standard deviation. If you produce a 0.1 standard deviation, it's a big impact. Um, so it's one, but there's a whole bunch of countries in which it's it, the estimates are negative. The students in um, Private schools are learning, actually have lower scores than students in public schools, and Indonesia is one of those, and I'm going to highlight Indonesia because I've lived in Indonesia, and I know Indonesia reasonably well, and it's a good, it's a good example. This data set also has a different observation for India, that Indonesia, that isn't negative, but it's, it's among the lowest of all countries. Um, so, first thing to take away from this is that one of the facts about the world is that on average, kids in private school score higher, but that the difference across countries is massive. That's not a uniformly true fact, because in some countries it's negative, and the magnitude of it varies enormously relative to its mean. So the mean is about 0.6, <laughs> but the variability is between the 25th and the 75th percentile is also about 0.6. So with the, even within the range of the bulk of the data, you go from 0.15, which is a very modest number, to 0.75, which is quite a big number. Okay, um, and the reason why this line isn't exactly in the uh, no, come to think of it, these are means, not medians. Otherwise, that'd be more near the mean. I think no, never mind. Or what I said, I think it's a mean, and I did the calculation, so I should know, but I'd have to look back at the program. Okay, so now we're going to start getting interesting me anyway, <laughs> um, is we're going to say, okay, let's take these same set of estimates of the raw, um, and then let's adjust them for observed student characteristics. So for every student, we know some amount of their socioeconomic status, some measure of their parents' education, parents' wealth. We know something about the kids. And so what we're going to do is we're going to run an OLS regression of the score on those factors. And then we're going to estimate 
the private sector premium conditional on those factors. So the private sector premium for an X equivalent equivalented kid. So one of the issues is like with SES, private schools are the private school kids are going to be from higher SES, public school kids lower SES. There's a gradient with respect to SES itself. So by so what we're going to do is we're going to pick some common SES and compare it. We're going to compare the same SES. And then that's our new estimate of the private premium. It's a X corrected at the same observes the is, am I being too simplistic or too is this going too fast or too slow? <laughs> All right. Okay. Good. <laughs> and you're from Stanford, sir. Okay. Um, <laughs> or at least bought a hat at Stanford. <laughs> Incredibly cheaper than the tuition, so I hope you just bought that. Uh, so, what happens? Exactly what we hoped and expected. The privacy premium goes way down. So, as opposed to being 0.6, it's now 0.34. The variance goes down a little, but there's still a ton of variance, right? Um, it's still even correcting for selection. Uh, even correcting for socioeconomic characteristics, students in Niger, that's NER, each of these is a country. Um, uh, students in Niger still do fantastically better and even correcting for characteristics, students in Ecuador um, only do a ton, correcting for characteristics, students in Ecuador do uh, modestly better. But the second thing to notice about this is that the extent to which correcting for the X's affects the premium differs radically across countries. So Indonesia, and I have to point out this is in Indonesia because another country is right on top of it, um, but the adjustment for Indonesia doesn't make any difference. But the adjustment for Indonesia doesn't make any difference because the kids in <laughs> private schools are actually less well off than the kids in public schools in Indonesia for reasons having to do with how Indonesia has allocated kids to public schools historically. In fact, the public schools are the best schools, and there's a competitive exam to get into the public junior and high schools. So the highest SES kids actually go to the public schools. And then if you're rich but dumb and you don't get into the public school, then you go to the private school. So the private school market is the rich but dumb kids. Um, uh, and then the bad public schools, so it stratifies in a different way, which means Given that's the allocation mechanism, it shouldn't be too surprising. Correcting for SES doesn't make any difference. You still learn less. Um, in Zambia, it doesn't make hardly any difference, even though the premium is super high. But in other countries, this is KHM happens to be Cambodia. Um, in you know Cambodia, it makes a huge difference. It goes from a very high premium to a not as high premium, but once you correct for it, which means the SES gradient is probably very high, meaning if it's hugely selective on SES, socioeconomic status, then you're going to get bigger adjustments. Okay. So <clears throat> now we're going to go one step further, and we're going to do the Oster. Um, and so we're, they have the private sector learning premium Oster. And it, and now unfortunately we lose the PISA because we can't do the, we can't do this for the PISA. We can only do this for these other data. And now we see that for these 32 countries for which we have the raw, the adjusted and the Oster, which we're taking as our estimate of the late, again, it's smaller still. Exactly as we would have expected, because why? Because <laughs> what Oster does is it says, oh, adjusting for the X has reduced it. There are unobserves that had we adjusted for them, it would have been lower still. And so it takes it further down. Okay. Sorry, why can't we do that for the PISA? What? Why can't we do the adjustment? Oh, you can if you want. Uh, <laughs> it's just these guys already did it for these. And so I just had to enter the data from their paper. To do it for the pizza, I'd actually have to go and like have the raw data and do it. So you can do it for pizza, just I haven't yet. Or, and you could, as your after you want. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it's relatively straightforward. And the beauty of the pizza is you can do it for 60 countries, right? Because it's all exactly the same format and stuff. But I just haven't. So you can't. 
Because after all, the beauty of the Oster is if you can do this, you can do the Oster. That's the beauty of the Oster, right? We don't need a randomized experiment to get to a late. We're getting to a quasi late or a, you know, whatever we want to call it. We're getting to an Oster lower bound. Okay, so now all of that, everybody kind of understands what we're doing, right? So we're going, it's like, look, what we really are kind of interested in, what would matter for policy is if there's some causally effect of moving a kid from school to school. We can't just look at the raw data and infer causation. We can't even really look at the adjusted data and infer causation because there's these other, you know, maybe more ambitious kids. Uh, kids who take schooling seriously are more likely to both do well in school and select, but we can't observe ambition. So there's these unobserves. Okay. Okay. Now here's, here's the reveal, right? Um, the question is, suppose I did the rely on the rigorous evidence procedure. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these countries, fosters or lates. I'm going to take the mean of those lates because those are rigorous evidence. The, the, pro, the private sector learning premium with just X's isn't rigorous evidence because we know that's a biased estimate. So I'm going to take, I'm going to predict for each country that its actual late is the average of all of the other country lates. And again, this is exactly what the protocol would be, is we would throw out all of the you know, non-rigorous estimates, we'd throw out all the regression estimates, we wouldn't use those. We would rely on the rigorous evidence. What's the rigorous evidence? It's the distribution of the Osters. Well, what am I going to use to predict your score as a function of the distribution of the rigorous evidence? So I'm probably going to use the mean. So then the question is, <laughs> if country by country, I use the rigorous estimate, is my root mean squared error prediction error of the late lower or higher than if I had just used the regression estimate? So again, the analogy with men lying is exact because I made it up for this. It's like, look, I know this OLS regression is wrong, but it could be less wrong than the heterogeneity across countries. So the cumulative error across a bunch of countries of just guessing for each country that it's their OLS is going to be lower than using the rigorous evidence, the, distribute, the mean of the rigorous evidence to predict your country. And that is exactly what happened. So, and again, the Oster now, I'm going to introduce one more complication. The Oster has a parameter that it, essentially, this is the assumption on the magnitude of the selectivity on, on observes relative to observes. So this is assume it's half as big as observes. This assumes for the same country that it's of equal size. So this obviously makes selection a bigger deal. And this has to be an assumption. You can't derive it from the data. Um, and so this is, <laughs> this graph is essentially the most stringent lower bound one could come up with for the late, meaning it, it's made the private sector premium look as low as possible. And this is the root mean squared error of just using every country's OLS. And then we're asking if we use various other estimates <laughs> as the single estimate for all countries, how much worse would the root mean square error be? And this is the answer. It's about, um, it's considerably higher root mean square error to use the average of the Oster with a parameter of one than it is to just use every country's. So the claim that you will make better decisions if you rely on the rigorous evidence is false. You would actually be better off just using your locally contextual but bias estimate because the magnitude of the bias country by country is less than the heterogeneity across countries in the truth. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Sure thing. Yeah, what? So you're uh, man. Sure, yeah. sure, sure, sure. So are you saying that? the average of all the lates for all the countries. Yeah. Use that as an estimate of yeah. the late of a particular country. Exactly. And that's for, for all countries. 
So then calculate the root, the mean squared out of each of those, add them up. And that would be worse than estimating the length of a particular country with the regression of that particular. Exactly. But but those are simple that, OLS. But the simple but what you're assuming is the right answer here is the length of that particular country. So trivially, like the best thing to do would be just to take the late of that particular country by definition, right? Absolutely. Yeah, which is a late. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So like yeah. having convinced me that regression is better than late, you can No, I'm not trying to convince you that. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm but right, but it's really horrifically expensive to do a true randomized control trial late versus do a regression. It's to all effects and purposes infinitely more expensive because to estimate the OLS, I just have to have the data that I generate anyway. Like if I do a test and I collect some background information, and I run that regression, that's free because in some sense, the fixed cost of collecting the data is what I was doing anyway. The cost of running a simple regression is easy. And then <laughs> there is one level at which you're saying you might as well do the Oster adjustment, right? But the other level of saying, and but by the way, the, the true believers in rigorous evidence don't believe in the Oscar, right? They believe only in RCTs or other well causally identified. And the cost of getting country by country to a late is just infinitely larger than getting to the bias estimate. So, yes, <laughs> you could just say, well, why the heck don't we just do the late for every country? But that's fiscally and otherwise wildly infeasible. Like, for every potential policy decision you make, you can't be doing a new RCT, right? And just, yeah, right? Uh, so yeah, trivially true. The RCT would have been better because we're taking the RCT as the truth. But the question is, that's not what we have and that's not what's being done and that's not what's being recommended. What's being recommended is you rely on a systematic review of the evidence across other countries and other contexts and you base your decision not on doing an RCT in your country, but on the other RCT evidence. Yeah. So, yes, <laughs> the truth, it, you know, and this is just a, and so it becomes a cost effectiveness kind of thing, which is like, look, if you're a huge country like India and you're going to do this at scale and it's super important, you should probably go ahead and do the RCT. But if you're a country that has low capacity for, anal for analysis, <laughs> low fiscal capacity, uh, it's a relatively small program, then you can try and get with the evidence you have that you know is biased and flawed, or you just can't possibly do an RCT for it. And the accommodation of that is this rely on the rigorous evidence thing. That, well, you're not going to do it RCT through your country. You're going to rely on the systematic review of the rigorous evidence. And the point I'm making is, given the magnitude of typical heterogeneity illustrated by this, um, you can, you, uh, and by the way, uh, you can end up doing much worse because I also do an experiment where, okay, let's say I, because this case, I have the late for every country, but typically a systematic review consists of three or five RCTs, right? <laughs> Which then means the heterogeneity of, you've got more heterogeneity and the, 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 the variability in what the mean of the places that happen to do the RCT is huge, right? So I also do the calculation, what if I just took one country? What if I only had one country that had done an RCT and I said, oh, you know, well, this is the only rigorous evidence we have because only this one country's done an RCT. Let's rely on that. Well, if you relied on Morocco <laughs> um, and then just assume that since Morocco had the rigorous evidence, I'm going to guess that every country's Morocco, you end up with just radically huge prediction error relative to just saying, screw Morocco, it's not us. We're just going to rely on our own biased OLS. Okay. Now, it's... Um, and the, this just illustrates um, that you could also imagine sort of some combination of the systematic, of the rigorous evidence in your own evidence, right? So you could have a weighted average. And here, just the point is that 
that weighted average of how much weight you should put on the rigorous evidence versus OLS is, is never zero. You should never just discount your own evidence. And to when you get to relying just on the rigorous evidence, um, if the degree of selectivity on the unobserved isn't in fact very big, you can end up with a root mean square error that's just massive relative to, so it, it's literally <laughs> doing the stupidest possible thing that everybody makes fun of because it's not methodologically sophisticated would on average produce better results than doing what they're proposing now. So, <laughs> uh, because, and again, this is just because, um, you know, the appeal to the rigorous evidence of the gold standard is kind of this rhetorical appeal to a false notion of what science is like. So you have to ask yourself, in our best possible model and theory and understanding of the phenomena, how much cross-contextual variability would we expect there to be? Because we have, you know, that's what we do is we build models of what are determining this variability in outcomes. So if you go back to the raw PSLP, the raw private sector premium, you have to have a model of why that exists, right? Like, why do we have such a variability? And why is it positive and why is the variability so large? And then you have to ask yourself, well, what would be my model? And in the best possible model, how much heterogeneity would expect? So a lot of the rhetorical appeal of relying on their rigorous evidence is appealing to science models in which the truth is constant across all contexts, right? Where did I go? Uh, yeah. So, you know, if we were talking about electron mass, then there's zero anticipated, in our best model, electron mass is constant. Right? Well, it's constant at given speed, but it's constant, right? Its rest mass is constant. And hence, the best estimate of the electron mass is what you should use for everywhere, because it is constant. That's why they're called constant. <laughs> is it in our model, our best available model is there's zero heterogeneity across contexts in them. But our best available models of social science phenomena don't look anything like that. It's a stupid model to assume that there is zero heterogeneity across contexts because it's just factually untrue. And moreover, not only is it factual, not only is there heterogeneity, there's explainable heterogeneity. So if we look at, this is a kind of completely nonlinear association between the SES adjusted private sector premium you know, just adjusting for the X's, and the raw score of just the public sector students. So not surprisingly, when the public sector does really badly, the private sector premium's really big. And when the public sector, like Denmark, uh, uh, always my favorite example, because no one has strong feelings about Denmark. Everyone's like, <laughs> I mean, you can hate your own private school students, but who can hate Denmark, right? Anyway, um, but when the public sector does a good job, not surprising the private sector doesn't do any better, than correcting for SES. So private sector might still have a premium, but there's no causal premium. And so in our best available model, we should expect a lot of heterogeneity of that. And moreover, there's explainable heterogeneity. If your public sector can't manage to get itself together to produce good outcomes, the premium is going to be higher. If the public sector, <laughs> okay, if the public sector, you know, and I'm going to point at countries, and and what's frustrating is the pointer, the laser pointer won't work. But you know, these are countries like Norway, Netherlands, Denmark, Singapore. These are countries that have effective public sector systems, and with effective public sector system, even the SES adjusted private sector premium is very low. Perfectly plausible, but completely inconsistent with assuming that we should extrapolate the late from country to country. Okay. So, and by the same token, and this is setting me up for one addition of, for the second thing I want to talk about, is that. Um, 
the selectivity, so this is the raw less the Oster bound. This is how much the five or six premium moved from just the factual raw to our best estimate of the late. Um, that, that, that's the degree of selectivity. So the difference between those two is not how much better private schools are. The difference between those two is how much more sorted are by SES and other characteristics are kids into private school. And not surprisingly, where inequality is really high, like Guatemala, the selectivity is really high. So when we adjust it, we reduce it a lot. And in low inequality countries, like our friend from Denmark, um, the selectivity is very low because it's an equal country. So the selectivity and stratification and sorting into public and private is much less. So adjusting Denmark, adjusting Denmark for selectivity has less of an impact. Okay. Now I've introduced a second massive problem with the rely on the rigorous evidence, right? Which is, uh, there's, <laughs> you know, in all of the debate about external validity, um, everybody keeps talking about the external validity of the late, right? Is the private sector premium, is the impact, and in all of this, the late, is that I'm using it, this is just an example. You could be using the late of microcredit for women, the late of gender training, the late of anything, right? In all of this, when you do an RCT and generate a rigorous estimate of the late, then the question is, does this estimate of the late have external validity? Can I extrapolate it from place to place, right? <laughs> but the true late, the biased estimate and the bias are linked in an arithmetic identity. They add up. That's the definition of the bias is the difference between the late and your estimate. So the difference between the late and the private sector premium with X is an estimate of how much bias there is for the late of using just the X's to estimate it. Which means you have to ask the question, how much external validity is there to the bias? And you have to realize that in a social scientific setting, if, if you're doing an RCT because the treatment is purposely sought out, which is the main reason to do an RCT, because otherwise the observational data can be treated as if it were generated by a random mechanism. So since there's purposive behavior that generates the gap between the late and the observational estimate, that itself is a social process that's deliberative, which means that itself is determined by policies and parameters, which means there's more or less external validity. So to the estimate of the bias. So another way of coming at the estimate of a country's late is instead of looking at the distribution of lates in other countries, look at the distribution of the bias in other countries and just adjust your observational estimate for the typical bias. And there's no reason, there's no conceptual, scientific, or logically coherent reason to choose one or the other. Because the problem is they have to add up. So you cannot have, uh, uh, I'm just frustrated because I've tried to explain this a million times. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. The late has to add up to the biased estimate and the bias, which means if You've got your own biased estimate in your own country, and somebody does an RCT in another country. Then you ask yourself, how much do I change my beliefs about the truth for my country relative to the observational estimate I have? Well, it could well be that they estimated <clears throat> that the bias was negative, but their late was bigger than yours. So I've estimated mine is 0.3. They have another country in which their true, their good late estimate is 0.4, but their adjustment, but their biased estimate was 0.5. So their estimate of the bias was negative 
the rough estimate of the late was 0.5. Okay, my bias estimate's 0.3. What the hell do I do? You can see there's no good answer to this because if I move it, because <laughs> if I move my bias estimate towards their late, I'm taking a stance that my bias was different than theirs, which is a claim about the causal processes in the world, that my causal processes that generated my bias were different than the causal processes that did their bias, in which case you've suddenly decided that there's external validity to the causal processes that generate the late estimates, but not external validity to the processes that generate the bias. And moreover, you have to believe that the, the difference in the causal processes that generated your bias happened to add up in a, in a completely weird and unexplained way. So I'm going to move my estimate of my late from 0.3 to 0.5, because 0.5 is what the rigorous evidence on late says. But that implies that my estimate of my bias is plus 0.2 versus the negative 0.1 they found. And somehow I have to believe that country by country, if I collapse all the countries to their estimates of the late, that all of those countries just happen to have the magnitude of the bias consistent with my moving my estimates of the late to the common rigorous evidence. That's insane. Like, that's just nuts, right? There's no, there's no, like, there's no science that could conceivably say that. That, oh, it just so happened, right? So, so it turns out um, the best thing to do to minimize your root mean square error, this is what happens if you use the average late, the average Oscar lower bound, and predict all countries. This is what happens if you just do the stupidest possible thing and touch the screen again. If you do the stupidest possible thing that everybody would make fun of you and deride for you're not aware of the latest science and just used OLS only, which again is substantially lower than having used this, you know, summary of the rigorous evidence. But if you just took the OLS, took the average of the of the estimates of the difference of the Oster and the, and the OLS and adjusted your OLS with that, you get a prediction error that's much lower. So actually, you're better off adjusting for the bias than reading. So if you're reading the study about the impact in the other country, that's actually not as helpful as reading about the study and how much bias there was in the other country. And it turns out, <laughs> assuming the bias is constant gives you better prediction than assuming the late is constant, which nobody in the world is talking about. Like, <laughs> you have never, you will not encounter in any of your classes the suggestion that forget about the literature review of what the impact of doing this is in other countries. Just pay attention to the difference between the rigorously estimated impact and the, and the observationally estimated impact and adjust your observationally estimated impact for the bias. And you're going to have a better prediction for your own country because for the fundamental thing, you've relied on evidence from your own country. That is for the underlying kind of PSOPX or the underlying observational. Okay. So, and this is just goes on about that. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to stop. Uh, so, and this is a bunch of completely incomprehensible diagrams that sort of make um, <laughs> And I'll, I'll share the slides, and ben already, Benjamin already has the slides. So anyway, I have a third and a fourth, but I'm going to stop. Um, because <laughs> by the time you get to the currently fashionable recommendation of doing a few selected RCTs because they're expensive and we can't do them everywhere in a few contexts, do a literature review that throws away all of the observational evidence in favor of that rigorous evidence, summarize that rigorous ev evidence by a suitably standard error. I mean, this is literally the methodological thing that they recommend. You know, you take some suitably weighted, each study weighted by its standard error estimate of the typical effect across the rigorous estimates, and then you should use that as the rigorous evidence for making decisions about your country. So <laughs> I think two objections to that is enough. The first being it's wrong. 
The second being it's logically incoherent as a scientific theory. Like <laughs> those two things don't convince you. Um, uh, and it's wrong in the sense that it just so happens to be wrong. It doesn't have to be wrong. It could be that for a phenomenon you're studying um, and some things using the actual biological sciences, it could be that the heterogeneity across contexts is very low, in which case for health things, it might be the Cochrane approach is a pretty good approach because we kind of believe human beings are human beings and the response of human beings under certain disease conditions to certain medicines are reasonably, even if they're not perfectly heterogeneous within individuals, they might be heterogeneous across contexts. And so that's a good thing, but for development economics and for, uh, but so far, um, I have done this computation for four different economic phenomena and in all of them, using the naive OLS is better than using the systematic review. So the score is four to nothing for a, for a claim people think is a theorem. Now, if you're truly a theorem, the score should always be zero in your favor. There shouldn't be a counterexample. Whereas it's not that I've generated counterexamples and they've generated examples. There are no examples that I know of in which the systematic review is actually demonstrated to generate superior results. And I've generated four different counterexamples from different phenomena, microcredit, wage differentials, this example of privacy premium, in which the claim that the standard implementation of systematic review based on river reference would produce better predictions of the in-context impact is just wrong empirically across context. You might happen to be a country that's near the mean and get it right, but you might not. And then secondly, if you kind of, once you realize that these things have to add up, uh, you can't logically coherently assert there's any underlying external validity to the parameters that happen to determine the causal impact, because that has implications for the parameters and things that determine the bias. And you're making unbelievably strong and completely unsupported claims about that part of the world on the assumption that the world just happened to line up. So all the parameters that generate lates are common, but all the parameters that generate bias are completely heterogeneous in a way that's completely implausible and unjustified. Okay, let me stop there and take questions.